name's Andy Porter, and I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Education, and I'm welcoming you to the uh, Bodek Lecture Series. Uh, thank you for coming. The, the Lecture Series began in 1993, and uh, it was created with the uh, support of uh, a very uh, generous and well-known member of the Penn community, Gordon Bodek. We have a Bodek lounge or center up on the top floor here, and Bodek this and Bodek that, and this is the Bodek lecture series. He, he was uh, a graduate of the college in 42, and he was a trustee of this university, and uh, he was one of the GSE overseers, so we're indebted to uh, Gordon Bodek. Uh, also, I want to mention that this uh, we, Graduate School of Education here at the University of Pennsylvania, is celebrating our uh, 100th anniversary. It's our centennial year. We're making a year out of it, and uh, we're ce celebrating that centennial uh, with this event. So, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to recognize a good friend and colleague of mine, Mary Beth Gasman. Now, Mary Beth uh, 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 is uh, uh, her center for uh, minority serving institutions, which she just created pretty much within the last 12 months, I think, uh, 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 is a co sponsor with the Bodek Lecture Series of this. Event, so thank you very much for that uh, generosity. And I, I just, uh, I want to, you know, a dean he wants to brag on his faculty, and I just want to brag a little bit about Mary Beth. She's amazing. Um, she created this center. I don't know what happened, but uh, there's a you know a little bug that comes along. It's called the center bug, and it bites people, and then they create a center and it went up there in my building up in the higher ed unit and it bit everybody up there and I, I got three I got three new centers now but uh, this was the first one out of the block and it's doing very well and I I want to say that uh, Mary Beth wanted to get a little uh, financial support for her center that's important and, and uh, <laughs> she's been just amazingly successful uh, in, uh, in fact uh, I'm asking every one of my faculty to uh, uh, rub her left arm a little bit. I'm hoping that uh, some of this magic that she has will rub off. But she's got funding now from Kresge and uh, uh, the Hensley uh, uh, Charitable Trust and the Mellon uh, and the uh, Education Testing Service and Kellogg and I don't. I can't wait to hear what's next. So uh, that's great. Her center, uh, I think, is a completely unique center in its focus and its mission uh, on uh, minority-serving institutions. Uh, there's no question but what uh, uh, Mary Beth has established herself as one of the world's authorities on on minority-serving institutions, and not only does she study them and uh, celebrate their mission, but she also helps them thrive. So, Mary Beth, thank you for all of the things that you do for our nation in GSE. Now, I don't get to uh, introduce our speaker, and it's a shame. It would be such an easy uh, thing to do to introduce him. He's, he's, but I will have to say this. I'm, I'm excited to be in the president of a truly great American. So, thank you very much for being here. Now turn it over to Mary Beth now. All right, thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome everyone. We wanted to keep this a little informal, so um, uh, I wanted I, I, I'll start off by telling you just a little bit about the center, and then I'd like to uh, informally introduce Dr. Lee Sullivan, and then we'd like to just have a really nice conversation. Uh, he as um, uh, Andy Porter said, uh, has led a remarkable life. And so um, hopefully you'll have some good questions for him as well. But uh, 
just real quickly, uh, the Center for Minority Serving Institutions that is one of the co-sponsors of this along with GSE uh, is uh, dedicated to uplifting minority serving institutions and to raising the national profile on them. Um, we study their strengths, we study their challenges, we try to provide resources, uh, both financial and other kinds of support. And um, we also support scholars who are interested in studying minority serving institutions. So I just want to um, uh, recognize all of the people who are affiliated with the center who are here in the audience, um, who you, you'll meet when, during the reception. And uh, they do really, really wonderful work. And it is uh, probably the most pleasant working experience I've ever had in my life. So it's just absolutely lovely to work with all of these people. Uh, and then another thing I wanted to do really quickly is uh, recognize um, two people uh, from the Helmsley Charitable Trust, uh, Sue and Ryan, if you could just say hello. And um, they're back there. And they are one of our funders. And also Catherine Lett from uh, Educational Testing Service. Where did you go? Oh, there you are. Um, uh, so I just want to recognize both of them because they're really, really wonderful to us. So I thought, well, I'll give you a little, a couple of things that I know about Dr. Lou Sullivan, and I'm probably going to call you Lou because I don't know if you remember, but um, uh, Lou and I wrote a book together, and when I first met him, I was just a little toddler, wasn't I? Yes. yes. And because um, <laughs> I'm only 19 now, so um, so when I first met him, I said, well, so what are we going to call each other? Is it Dr. Doctor, or are we going to, what are we going to say? And so we just decided on Lou and Mary Beth, and so we'll comfortably do that. But normally, I would um, introduce him as Dr. Sullivan, because I, I have an amazing respect for him. But uh, so a couple of things that I wanted to start out by saying before we uh, ask questions is, um, that Lou graduated magna cum laude from Morehouse School, from um, Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. And you graduated in 1954, right? Yes. Yes. So, um, and uh, he, uh, he is a Morehouse man. He loves Morehouse College. And uh, it's, it's really, in, in writing a book about Morehouse College and the Morehouse School of Medicine with him, I was able to see just how much he loves the institution and how proud he is of the institution. And I really think that you live Morehouse College on a daily basis. So um, He also graduated from Boston University School of, uh, of Medicine in 1958. And he'll t we'll talk more about that at, at some point. Uh, I think it's important to say that he was US Secretary of Health and Human Ser Services. Uh, he also was, and I thought this was kind of interesting and maybe something that people don't know about you, but in 1985, you were one of the founders of the Medi medical, aid, medical Education for South African Blacks. I thought that was kind of interesting, especially because that's before the fall of the end of apartheid, right? The fall of apartheid. Yes. Um, one of the things I think that he's most proud of, and I'm sure he'll talk a little bit more about this, is that he was... First of all, the founding dean and director of the medical education program at Morehouse College, and then he became, um, that program became the School of Medicine at Morehouse College, and then Lou became the president of the Morehouse School of Medicine, a role that he served for over two decades, and in between was U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services. Um, I think one of the things that uh, I know about him that I like the most is that he co-authored a book with me called The Morehouse Mystique, and we worked together for two solid years, didn't we? Two years. And then I tried to get rid of him, but he just wouldn't go away. So, uh, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I remember he called me up one day and he said, I read your book, Envisioning Black Colleges, and I'd like you to write a book about Morehouse School of Medicine. And so I said, okay, well, let's, let's start talking. So we started talking, and I, I, um, I just, it was really, really a wonderful, pleasant experience uh, to write a book with him. And then uh, he surprised me by coming out with his autobiography recently, and uh, which I just finished reading a few weeks ago. And I, I have to tell you that uh, I think that you will really love it. It's incredibly inspiring. And it's actually um, wonderful. It's written in a really beautiful way. And for all of my students out there, you might want to take a look at it because it's written in a beautiful, straightforward, and simple way, like I would like you all to write. <laughs> so, um, so uh, and then the last couple of things that I wanted to mention are two things that Lou does right now, and we'll also talk about this. He's chairman of the board of the National Health Museum in Atlanta, Georgia, which is a mu museum dedicated to health, and you'll find out just how much he cares about being healthy. And he's also chairman of um, 
the Sullivan Alliance, which is, is trying to transform the health professions and to diversify them. And then last thing that I wanted to bring up, for those of you interested in historically black colleges, Lou was the chairman of the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges as well. Now, he has done a million other things, but we would literally be here all night, and that is not a lie. We would be here all night talking about those. So what I'd rather do is have you guys listen to him and not have me read his resume. So I thought that um, we would just uh, kick it off with some questions. And what I'm going to do is ask him a few questions, and then at some point, uh, we will um, open it up for questions. I've got two lovely individuals who are who are my two mic people. Okay, look at that. Mark and Fernando are going to have microphones, and Lou said he will answer anything, right? Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> so remember, he worked in politics, so <laughs> he's okay with that. So, um, Lou, I thought that I would start off by asking you. I think a question that a lot of people are always interested in because you're a doctor, right? Um, how did you get interested in medicine? I think that's it's such an important question, especially for young people who might be hesitant about that. Yes, well, I really knew by the time I was age five that I wanted to be a doctor. And that uh, came out because of um, a series of uh, circumstances. First of all, I love nature. Uh, curious about birds, about flowers, trees. Uh, what is it about uh, nature that uh, this rhythm, that is, plants come up at a certain time in the spring, leaves turn at a certain time in, in the fall, etc. Et so I've always had that kind of uh, curiosity. But um, more specifically about medicine, uh, first of all, I was born in Atlanta at Grady, the public hospital, and I was born in 1933 in the middle of the Depression. My father was a life insurance salesman for Atlanta Life, uh, which is an interesting history itself. It was founded by Alonzo Herndon, who, who was a freed slave. He uh, started out cutting hair in downtown Atlanta for whites. And he picked up, he was uneducated, and picked up enough information that he started uh, this uh, uh, burial society, which uh, evolved into Atlanta Life, which really became the economic engine for um, the black community uh, in Atlanta. My father was a salesman for Atlanta Life. In the Depression, nobody was buying life insurance. So um, he, he moved our family from Atlanta. It was the second of two boys. And he went into a partnership at a funeral home in Albany, Georgia. That lasted two years. That partnership dissolved. He had some disagreement with his partner. So he moved to Blakely. Blakely is, was a town at that time of about 10,000 people in southwest Georgia. He established his own funeral home there. Well, my mother was a school teacher, uh, but my, my father, this was the first funeral home for blacks in Blakely, and I talk about this in the book, uh, some of the circumstances uh, around, around that. But because he uh, had a funeral home, he also operated an ambulance service. There was one black doctor in southwest Georgia south of Columbus, from, from Columbus, south to the Florida border, distance of more than 100 miles, and, uh, and west of Albany to the Alabama line, again about 70 miles, one doctor there. His name was Joseph Griffin. I would go with my father uh, riding in the ambulance, quote, helping him <laughs> at, at my young age, uh, but uh, I'd go with him, and Dr. Griffin was a larger-than-life figure. He uh, had built this brick clinic. He was obviously highly respected in, in the community, but most important to me was there was magic about him. He could do something nobody else could do. He could cure people. He could treat people who had illness. Uh, and the fact that he had this magical capability, uh, and he was highly respected, and there was something mysterious that went on uh, in that facility, that I said, this, uh, this is what I, I, I want to do. He would come out in his scrub uh, u uniforms, uh, you'd open the, the door to his clinic, there'd be the smell of ether there. That was a smell I'd never had before, so I decided that's what I, I want to do. And when I told my mother, she said, Louis, that's great, you'd be a great doctor. So I'd never had any doubt uh, about it, and all along, I met other physicians, uh, and um, that, uh, that was how that started, and I really 
uh, have had, uh, for me, a very rewarding, very exciting uh, career. I, and we'll, we can talk about the various phases of my career. I can say every phase I enjoyed. The only regret that I have is I couldn't do all of the things at the same time. <laughs> so. All right. Okay, great. Um, I guess one of the things that, because uh, we have a number of students in the audience, and um, I think there's always this curiosity about Morehouse. And in fact, I noticed that one of the, uh, Greg Lyles, who's here from the United Negro College Fund, um, when I went up to him and said hello to him, um, one of the first things he said is, two of my sons went to Morehouse, right? So um, I think there's this, always this interesting curiosity about Morehouse and Morehouse men. And if you don't have that curiosity, you should read a little bit and find out a little bit about Morehouse men. But can you talk to us about going to Morehouse and also how that played a part in you ending up becoming a doctor, going to medical school? I guess I'm really interested in these questions because it, it, it is hard to get um, more African Americans in medical school, and so was there anything that happened there that made it easier, that made it, uh, that inspired you more? Yes. Morehouse is a special place. Um, it really has always been successful. Its students, its alumni have been successful, whether they're going into business or law or medicine what have you, and I think it's the environment, because I, I tell my friends, I don't think that people who go to Morehouse are any brighter than anyone else, but it's the culture of the institution. You taught, uh, said, you told in so many ways when you get there, congratulations for being here. And you told, you're here because you are bright, you've accomplished, but what we are going to do is help you really achieve great things. We expect you to do great things. Uh, and you, see, you meet alumni who've done those things. Um, uh, we're talking about uh, not only Martin Luther King Jr., our most famous alumnus, but other people such as Chuck Willie uh, at uh, the Harvard School of Education. Uh, he had a brother who was in my class. Chuck finished Morehouse in 48, so I didn't meet him until later because I entered Morehouse in 50. Uh, we had uh, Sam Dubois Cook. Uh, president of Dillard College, uh, himself a great sociologist. Uh, so there was something about the school that um, really, um, when you left there, you left there expecting that you were going to be successful, and really almost with a sense uh, of obligation, that you were going to prove to your teachers that uh, the time they spent uh, with you was really worthwhile, and you're going to do that by uh, indeed uh, achieving. When I went to Boston University School of Medicine, I was the first Morehouse alumnus to go to Boston University. And out of a class of 76 students that entered uh, BU Medical School that year, I was the black in the class. Um, I met my classmates who had finished Williams, Dartmouth, Amherst, Columbus, uh, Columbia, Harvard, etc. And the typical um, exchange with them, which I talk about in the book, was, you know, hi, I'm uh, Joe Alpert, I, I'm a graduate of Amherst. Uh, Lou Sullivan, wh you, where did you go to school? He said, well, Morehouse. Oh, yes, Morehead, great school. I said, no, 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 not Morehead, Morehouse. Oh, Moore, well, where's Morehouse? So that was the thing that greeted me there. So I was thinking those first few weeks, well, gosh, how am I going to do with these guys? Am I going to really measure up? Am, am I going to embarrass myself? Am I going to let my folks down? Will I disappoint Morehouse? Well, I, we had our first anatomy examination three weeks later, and I did well, and I relaxed. And of course, I ended up uh, graduating second in my class at, at, at BU. So, so the, my experience in reality was that Morehouse had trained me well. And it's because of that environment of really high demand, uh, you had to work hard, uh, but also you were told that we expect you to do well. You are here because uh, you have the capability and we are going to work with you to help, uh, help develop that. And with the role models that we had looking at our alumni, that's it. So I think it's a culture uh, that really uh, infused in us that expectation, that responsibility, that we were lucky to be there. Uh, not everyone had that opportunity, but we were to use that opportunity to serve others. And that was another tenant there of the school. Our president was Benjamin Mays, one of the most remarkable persons I've ever met. All of us wanted to be like Dr. Mays. 
He was a minister. His own life story uh, was inspiring. Um, he came from a town called 96 South Carolina because the Highway 96 went through it. He went to Bates College and finished valedictorian in his class in 1906, the one black in his class at, at Bates, on to University of Chicago where he got his PhD in philosophy and, and religion. So those were the things that really uh, inspired me and inspired other people at, at Morehouse. The reason this book is called Morehouse Mystique is that because we call it the mystique. What is it that makes the place different? It is that mystique. It's that intangible but very real uh, thing that makes you want to achieve, makes you want to have a life that's significant, that's not simply significant to you, but significant to your community. You want to be sure that the places where you are, the communities where you live, they're better off because you were there. So that, that's what Morehouse does too. And I still feel that way uh, uh, today. It's like being part of a large fraternity. You're part of other fraternities too, right? Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes, I happen to be a part of an Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Which, which, <laughs> See, I do my homework. <laughs> Um, so when you, when you said significant, I guess I'm, I'm wondering, uh, I'll just ask a question about this. Do you think Morehouse was so significant to you as you were growing up? How do you convince people that a college for black men is, is, um, a, a, is significant today when some people might say to you, well, we have all these different institutions. Why would we still have a college, a black college for black men? Why would that be significant today? Sure. Well, um, the way I answer that is this. When I went to BU, I said I was the one black in my class. There were black students at Harvard, in Columbia, and elsewhere. Where were they? Why? They were very bright, so they got into those schools. What happened to them that they didn't show up in medical school? So, in other words, um, what I'm saying is that Morehouse is an institution that not only gives you knowledge, but gives you a sense of responsibility, a sense of belonging, a sense of service, uh, and all of those things, I think, make you a better person. So Morehouse works not only on your intellect, it works on your spirit and your, and your soul. So that's why I say uh, places like Morehouse are, are important. Going to college, uh, to me, is more than simply going to the next level of education. You're going to the next phase of your life. Because you think about it, this is your first time away from home, you're on, on your own, you're forming new relationships, you're meeting new people, you're learning n new things, and you're on, you're on your own and you're setting up your value system. You're no longer at home following mom and dad's rules. You're developing your own rules. Now hopefully those uh, rules that, you're, that are similar to, to, to your, your parents, but it's really that kind of personal development uh, that I got that I think makes places like Morehouse important, and particularly because of the fact that students, um, a lot of students uh, at black colleges are really from poor families. Oftentimes the first time, the first uh, person in their family to go to college. So if you have an institution that really works not only on in your intellect, but also uh, on your social sense and on your spiritual sense, it really makes you a whole person. So I think that's why those schools are special. Okay. Uh, so uh, when I introduced you, I listed all of these different accomplishments. And as I was saying that there are many, many more accomplishments uh, that you've had in your life, I remember one time when I was working on this book with him, uh, his assistant gave me your Rolex. I mean, your Rolodex, right? Not your Rolex. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> she never had a Rolex. That. I know, I know. <laughs> Your, your Rolodex, and for those of you who are, you know, 22 and under, a Rolodex is uh, this thing that spins around and it has business cards on. It's sort of like your, your uh, contacts in your iPhone. <laughs> um, so uh, she gave it to me for, to look up some names, and I was looking in there, I was like, how can this man know these people? And there were some really interesting people in there. So I know that all of those connections came from having this incredibly significant life. But I wonder, um, to you, what is your most significant accomplishment throughout your career? Um, you know, is it, is it being Secretary of Health and Human Services? Is it being President Morehouse? Is it being a doctor? Is, is it now? What, what is your most significant? Well, 
as I said before, I have enjoyed every phase of my uh, career o over the years, so, so I'm proud of a lot of things. But um, I'd say the thing that, to me, is the most significant accomplishment is the development of the Morehouse School of Medicine. Because I envision that school 100 years from now, 200 years from now, uh, when I'm long disappeared from the earth, that school will be contributing uh, to our society at that time. In the same way that this university, I guess founded 200 years ago, is still here contributing to the life of not only Philadelphia and this country, but really uh, around, around the world. So, so to me, uh, that's important. The other thing um, I'd say is, is this. <clears throat> In the second half of the 20th century, we had a period of expansion of medical education uh, and, uh, that occurred between 1956 and 1981. Uh, we increased the number of medical schools from 80 to 127. We had 47 new schools uh, that opened to, to increase the number of physicians uh, in the country. Morehouse School of Medicine is the only one of those schools that's a four-year school that's predominantly African-American. Our goal in uh, creating that institution was not only to increase the number of black physicians uh, in the country, because we're still uh, woefully underrepresented, but also to create an institution. Because uh, I say that um, what we're saying is we in the black community can develop a medical school that meets all of the criteria uh, that are used to measure uh, the quality of the institution, all of the national examinations, accrediting bodies, uh, the achievement of our students, and I'm, I'm proud of the fact that although we're still a young school, we've had a U.S. Surgeon General, Regina Benjamin, one of our alumni, president of another medical school, Wayne Riley, served as President Harry. So one South African uh, graduate who went back to South Africa and established the first nationwide blood banking system in South Africa, modeled after the Red Cross blood banking system. Uh, I was uh, there in 2010, had dinner with them. They were celebrating the completion of their first year of operation without a single case of HIV or hepatitis C transmission. Uh, so uh, to me, the most important criterion by which you measure any institution is what happens to its graduates you can have great facilities, uh, you can have um, tremendous athletic teams uh, and social activities and so forth, but the important thing is a university is to help develop young people and prepare them for life. So what do the graduates uh, do? So, so that's, those are the um, thoughts that I, I've always had. In, so what we're saying, developing the Morehouse School of Medicine, not only were we addressing a social need, we were making a statement to the community in this country saying that blacks can do the same thing that anyone else can do if we have the resources and we can do it in a first class way. So that's to me is another important uh, issue in developing the Morehouse School of Medicine. So you know, one question I think that oftentimes people have is uh, why is it so important to have African American doctors? What, why? Why, why do you care so much about that? Why have you invested in the Sullivan Alliance? Um, it, uh, that must be part of the reason behind starting the Morehouse School of Medicine, right? Even though it's oh, yeah. very diverse. Yes. But um, why is that so important? Well, the reality we, we confront is this. Blacks in the U.S. and other minority populations as well, Native Americans really uh, are in terrible shape in terms of health, same as the black community. Well, um, there are a number of reasons for that. Not one, but, but uh, not one reason, but among the reasons is lack of black health professionals. When you think about this, you go to your doctor. That's, uh, that's a personal transaction. And I often state that the health professions are science-based professions, but they're practiced in a social setting. And by that, uh, this, this is what I mean. When you go to the doctor, you're going to be answering some personal questions. You know, are you fearful? Do you have pain? Uh, or uh, do you uh, have, you think you have cancer? Or some uh, sexually transmitted disease? Or things like that. Well, for this to be a useful and successful interaction, you have to really talk about a lot of personal information. So that means if you're going to do that, 
you trust the individual that you're sharing that information that they're not going to ridicule you, they're not going to criticize you, they're not going to share that information with someone else because that's your, your private information. And if you don't have that trust, you don't share that information. So today, uh, and the same t occurs so far as women. Many women prefer to have um, a woman physician as their primary care physician because they feel more comfortable. That's perfect, perfectly fine. So, so the point is, we need to have in the health professions people who mirror our society, people that you feel who understand your culture, your value system, people you, you trust. So that's why we need to really uh, have more black and other minority physicians. Now that's not the only thing. We have to have people who know how to use the system because if in the black community uh, there's a level of distrust of the health system higher than that in the white community because everyone in the black community can tell you there was a Tuskegee syphilis study where men were not treated uh, back in the, in the 30s uh, uh, when sulfur drugs came along and then penicillin which was a cure for, for this but they were really uh, followed to learn more about the natural history of this disease so that kind of thing doesn't happen anymore uh, there are all kinds of uh, review systems, uh, etc., to make sure, but, but the fact that that happened still means that a lot of people still don't, uh, don't trust uh, the system. And we see that uh, elsewhere in, in other ways. One of the things we are close to in internationally is getting rid of polio. Now, one of the models of the, of the 20th century, we got rid of smallpox which uh, was a highly contagious and often fatal disease, but we had a uh, drive uh, through vaccination that we've now eliminated that disease from the world. We're close to doing that with polio. The reason we haven't accomplished it is not scientific, it's not technological, it's really a question of trust. In northern Nigeria, uh, among some of the Muslim populations there, they feel that this is a Western plot to sterilize their, their women so that they won't have children. Uh, similar things in Pakistan, a couple of area pockets where we, a couple of other pockets where we have not eliminated uh, this. So, that, so these are examples of why uh, in a health system to be successful for it to work properly is more than having the knowledge base, it's having the trust of the people, whether individually or, or or community. That's why we need more diversity in the health professions. So, um, as part of the Sullivan Alliance uh, to you know, really work on diversifying the uh, health professions, what kinds of things do you do? What, what, what do you do? Do you work with colleges? Do you work with people in high schools? Or um, what, yes. what do you do? Yes. First of all, the Alliance is based in Alexandria, Virginia, in the Washington, D.C. area. And what uh, we're doing is working to indeed increase the uh, racial uh, and ethnic diversity in the health professions. The way we do it is organizing alliances within states. We started 19, uh, in, in 2004 uh, with the first alliance in Virginia. Uh, and it actually turned out to be what we call a Virginia-Nebraska alliance. That was pure serendipity. Uh, we spoke at a conference in June of that year there looking at uh, the diversity of physicians in the state of Virginia. And I um, pointed out that there were five black colleges in the state of Virginia. Uh, they had virtually no relationship to uh, the uh, Commonwealth uh, uh, University, the Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, or the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, et cetera. And I suggested, well, to increase uh, the number of black and other minority uh, physicians, you need to really develop some relationships among the colleges so that um, you can develop programs to see that students have the uh, educational uh, skills that they need to navigate uh, uh, health professions. So, so they responded to that uh, and uh, then asked if I would then come back and help them organize it. So we organized this back in September of 2004. Nebraska came along because it so happened that the Chancellor for Health Sciences at the University of Nebraska was there in Richmond. He had previously been chairman of the pediatric department there and he was back, back visiting. And so he said at this conference, you know, this is an interesting idea. We have an interest in Nebraska, so if you do this, we'd like to be a part of it. 
So that's how they became a part of it. So we have summer research programs where the students uh, sought out as research uh, uh, assistants. Uh, some have written uh, papers on some of the, res the research that they've been involved in. Uh, but we've now um, set up alliances in nine, uh, in nine states altogether. Uh, uh, they're uh, North Carolina, Florida, uh, Alabama, uh, Nebraska, I, I mentioned, Maryland, uh, Ohio is the northernmost uh, 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 state. And we're working on several other states to develop in, them there. So it really is depends upon several criteria. We have to have someone within the state who is interested and who's willing to give leadership in the state. Because states are different. Um, and uh, who really has a network that we can work, work with. So, so that's, um, uh, and you also get local funding uh, with each, each of the state alliances. So that's been um, very interesting, and we need to have a lot more of, uh, of, of that. And we work with a number of organizations um, in states as well as national organizations, such as Association of American Medical Colleges as well. Great. Um, so I want to um, switch gears a little bit and ask you a question about being uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. And one of the funniest experiences that I had when we were writing uh, this book, The Morehouse Mystique, together is uh, that Lou asked me to accompany him to interview uh, George and Barbara Bush in, in their home in Houston. It was very funny. Um, and so, um, so anyway, uh, I, I had no idea that he knew them so well. And uh, so we ended up having lunch at uh, their home, which was uh, an interesting thing to do. And uh, at least it was for me. I think you've probably been there many times. But tell uh, everyone how you uh, ended up being US Secretary of Health and Human Services. Was that a goal of yours uh, once you became president of a, of a, um, a medical school? Was, was that something you sought after your whole life? Or um, did, did it just happen? Right. Well, um, my answer there is, first of all, a lot of things I've done, I didn't plan. They happened. Uh, and one of my favorite expressions is chance favors the prepared mind, meaning being ready. Now, my goal when I went to medical school was to come back to Georgia and be a, a family doctor like Dr. Griffin. Uh, I thought that was, was, was great, but that didn't, didn't happen. I, when I went to medical school, I learned there was a lot more to medicine than I, than I knew. Uh, and I learned about hematology and became a, a researcher in hematology. Uh, and I never really got back to Georgia like I had intended with Dr. Griffin. But the Morehouse School of Medicine served as my proxy because my students have gotten back to Georgia for me. Uh, and have done this in a, in a much greater, greater way. But the, um, the way this happened, um, first of all, when Morehouse College decided they wanted to start a medical school, I agreed to serve on an advisory committee to the college about that. I had a lot of questions as to whether the college should do this. I became convinced over a year that yes, uh, they should, and the college could do it. Uh, and then uh, I had no idea at the time uh, that I would be, be a part of it. Uh, but then once uh, the committee made its recommendations that they should proceed, uh, I ended up in an interview, uh, which um, is in the book that Mary Beth and I uh, talk about in New York, uh, when I was down there, quote, as a consultant, not as a candidate. Uh, and what was supposed to be a, about a two hour luncheon turned out to be a four hour discussion. And I think I talked myself into a job at the time because I really, it became obvious that I was more fascinated uh, and intrigued uh, by this than had been the case. So that was serendipity. The first building we constructed for the medical school was dedicated in July of 82. We had invited um, uh, President Reagan, the new president, to come and speak because by that time, I'd started in 75, so this is now seven years later because when we started with construction, it was on the college campus and temporary facilities but the first building for the medical school was in, in 82. So when that was, was uh, developed, uh, we invited President Reagan because we wanted to have him as a new president there to bring uh, attention to the school as well as establish relationship with that administration. They held us up for a long time, only to tell us after several months the president couldn't come. So we then uh, sort of wrote a nice courteous letter but had a very clear 
uh, uh, strain within it of indig indignation, saying, how could you hold us up this long only then to tell us the president couldn't come? Can't you send the vice president? That worked. So he came and spoke uh, in July of 82 when uh, we dedicated this, this building. And here was all these black Democrats, Andy Young, John Lewis, uh, Ed McIntyre, who was then the uh, black mayor of Augusta, you know, getting their pictures taken with him. So um, everyone had a great time, including Vice President uh, Bush. Two weeks later, I get a call from him. So he asked if I would be willing to go with him to Sub-Saharan Africa for a two weeks of visiting eight countries. And I said, well, gosh, Mr. Vice President, I would love to go, and I'm honored that you'd ask, but I'm not in government, so why would you want me to go? What would my role be? So he said, well, Lou, to be honest with you, we don't have an Andy Young in our administration. Andy, as you know, was very prominent in the Carter administration, the UN ambassador, etc." He said, I don't feel I can go to Sub-Saharan Africa representing the Reagan administration without a prominent African-American uh, in my delegation. So you do me a favor, but more importantly, if you'd be willing to go, you'd do the country a service uh, to go. So I appreciated his honesty. So I went. Barbara was on that trip. I met her for the first time. So while Bush was meeting with heads of state, she was talking to adult literacy groups. These were women's groups, usually illiterate. Uh, and so after two weeks in these eight countries coming back, I said, Barbara, you know, um, you and I are in the same business. I'm in medical education. You're in adult literacy education. We're in a new school. We need to have people like you on our board. Will you join? She accepted. When that happened, my wife and I were with frequently invited to things in Washington. We got to know the Bushes very well. Uh, and I learned about his strong commitment to education. When he was running for president, I was supporting him uh, because I thought he'd be a, a good a president. But I was also supporting one of my trustees who desperately wanted to be secretary. He had been uh, he had almost elected in 1985, but uh, was one of three finalists. Uh, so I urged uh, Vice President Bush and said, you know, if you win this election, you know, Monroe, whom you've met on my board, would be a great uh, secretary. So he said, well, Lou, let's look at it. So to make a long story short, when he won the election, I called him up the next day and said, congratulations. <laughs> I'd sent him a tie about three weeks before, a red tie with blue elephants on it. Uh, no, I'm sorry, blue tie with red, red elephants on it. I said, wear this on election day and bring you good luck. So he did. So when I called, I said, I see you did what I uh, suggested you did, so see, it worked. Congratulations. I said, now remember we talked about Monroe. He says, oh yeah, Lou, I, I remember that, but look, if in about two weeks when things settle down, if you'd be willing to come up to Washington, I need to talk with you about that. So I said, fine. And I hung up the phone. I said, what is that? Maybe I'm kidding myself. It sounds like he wants to talk to me. And sure enough, that's what happened. So in other words, serendipity. It happened that he had seen my work as president of the medical school. He got to know me personally over those uh, years from 83 to 89 uh, and felt comfortable with, and he knew exactly uh, what uh, I was interested in, in because when he asked me, uh, when I went up to see him, I said, well, Mr. Uh, president I like, you know, if I'm secretary, there are a lot of things I'll want to do and uh, would you support it? I said, we need to have more minorities in this uh, uh, agency. We need to address the health issues of uh, blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, uh, because the health is... He said, well, Lou, I support you. I said, we need to have more women in senior positions, etc." cetera. So, um, so he uh, accepted all those and said he would support me. So that, that's, that's how that happened. One other thing, and then I'll let you... Get the next, next question. One of the things that happened when I was secretary was in January of 90, I was here at the University of Pennsylvania, School of Medicine. New research building built with federal dollars, and I spoke about that, but I talked about R.J. Reynolds and how dare they try to introduce this new cigarette uptown here in Philadelphia. A non-filtered, uh, mentholated, high tar, high, cig high uh, nicotine uh, cigarette focused on the black community. Because uh, uptown, you know, in the black community, when you're going uptown, you're going to be going to a dressy thing or, or what have you. And I really spoke out 
thinking that maybe by the end of the day I'm going to be on my on a plane back to uh, Georgia. I hadn't cleared the speech with the White House. <laughs> but um, to my su pleasant surprise, R.J. Reynolds didn't fight. I was ready for a fight. And they, uh, I guess about 10 days later, I sent a letter to the president of the company uh, telling them how uh, I thought this was really corporate irresponsibility. Uh, so they withdrew um, that, that those uh, events. So one of the important things in my tenure happened right here at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Very nice. I didn't know you were feisty like me, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess uh, I'll ask just a couple more questions and we can open it up to other people. But make sure that you have questions because otherwise I'll just keep asking questions. Um, I guess one of the things that I always uh, like to talk about when uh, there are students in, in the audience is how we overcome obstacles. And I'm just wondering, are there any obstacles that you ran into, um, like large obstacles in your career, and what did you do to overcome them? Yeah, well, I would say the largest obstacle, frankly, was growing up in a segregated society. A society that was saying to me, and everybody who looked like me, that you're not good enough, that you're not acceptable. Uh, and we saw that in so many ways. When we moved, when my family moved to Blakely, my parents, um, when I was uh, age in the fifth grade, sent me and my brother first to Savannah for one year, then to Atlanta the next year, to attend schools because schools in rural Georgia really were not good for blacks. We got hand me down books. Once they got new books at the white school, then they send the old books over to, to, the, to the black school. And my father was quite an activist uh, there. We talk about that in, in the book too, because he sued the uh, early county school system, you know, because they were separate but not equal uh, 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 facilities. So, so I would say that was the obstacle. That was not only the physical inconvenience and the social insult this, this represented, uh, but really the psychological impact, because you had a system that was trying to say to you, you know, really, you're second rate. So, so that, so, so fortunately, through my parents and other role models like Dr. Mays, um, Dr. Griffin, etc., they were the ones who were really refuting this. Uh, and, and, and frankly, this is one of the reasons I'm sure that all of my life I've committed to doing things to say that's not true. We are as good as anyone else. This nation should be good enough to live up to its creed to uh, what it professes to be its value system, that all men are created equal, and endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. Well, yeah, interestingly enough that our you know, founders said these things, but these applied to white men, didn't even apply to white women. Uh, and so, so I feel that I have a responsibility uh, as a black American to help make those uh, words really ring true for everyone, and if we're successful with that, we will be a better nation. So, so my role is not to simply be a critic, but to be a change agent, uh, to contribute my talents and my energy to really making this a better country. This is my country. I want it to be better. So that's why I'm doing that. Very nice. Thank you. Um, I guess the last question that I wanted to ask has to do with uh, the future of uh, African Americans in medicine and uh, medical education for African Americans. Uh, have, over the course of your lifetime, especially the more recent uh, part of it, have you have you seen a lot of change? Do you see young black people being more motivated to go to medical school? And what do you think it would take to get more African Americans to pursue medical school? I mean, it, it's obvious that you had to face segregation. I think there are lots of young people that still face segregated school systems, right? It's obvious that you had these great parents who believed in you. There are some children of all racial and ethnic backgrounds that don't always have homes, don't come from homes that people believe in them. Um, so what could we, what can we do and what can uh, universities do, what can current doctors do, uh, what can we do as a society to m ensure that there are more black doctors so that we give better treatment to African Americans overall and others in, in, in terms of medicine? Well, we, really, we need to do a lot, and there's a lot for everyone to do. I'd say that among the things, we need to strengthen our K-12 school system, 
because too many young people really uh, deprived of a strong uh, preparation. And once you get behind, it's hard to catch up. Uh, so, so we need to, to do that. We also, um, you know, Bill Cosby got into trouble really uh, being critical of black parents. We need to be critical of, of ourselves and, and not ashamed of this. We need to build stronger families because one of the problems, uh, when you ha and this affects all segments of our society, not just the black community, whites as well, the reality is single parent families generally abhor us. And it's more difficult uh, raising children uh, in those circumstances. So we need to do everything we can to strengthen families. Because I say I'm lucky because I had two parents around, you know, you know, really making sure that I told the line, giving, serving as role models and so forth. So we need to do those other things. We can't lay it all on the school system. You know, we really have to do everything we can and also through our organizations, whether they're the YMCA or Big Brothers uh, uh, or 100 Black Men or the NAACP, and, et cetera, really serve as mentors and role models for our young people and encourage them. The other uh, thing that concerns me uh, is, and this is for all of higher education, it's getting harder for our young people to go to college because of the expense uh, and the reduction in scholarship uh, funds, etc. That's a serious mistake. If we don't invest in our young people, we're not investing in our country. We're not in, uh, training people who are going to be the engineers of tomorrow, who will develop uh, Googles, uh, or who will uh, discover penicillin, uh, or eight drugs for AIDS, or, or the Ebola uh, challenge that, that we have now. But to me, the most important investment uh, that we could make um, is, you know, first of all, seeing that our young people have opportunities and information, but also that they have the financial resources so that they can really develop, develop their, their minds. So, so there really is a lot for everyone to do, whether it's K through 12 or whether it's in college or even at the graduate and professional level here. Because when we do that, we really are investing in our society. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I want to open it up for some questions. There's only one ground rule, and that is we're taking questions, not speeches. So, you know, sometimes people wish that they were the speaker, and then they want to make a speech. So um, if that happens, I might just say, what is your question? Okay. Um, and if you'd like to make a speech later, I'll go over in the corner, and you can give it to me. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but right now, we're trying to, you know, we want to ask the questions. So um, let's see. Where, where are the wonderful people with microphones? Got some? All right, so we, I think we have a question right over here. We have two questions, all right. Uh, it would be great if you could say your name and maybe um, if you have any affiliation, and then the question would be great. Okay, I'm Barbara Bravo, and I was um, an undergraduate at Penn and graduated from the Graduate School of Education with all but my dissertation and was a principal in the school district of Philadelphia as well as a teacher. Um, but my question is about the medical profession. Today, there seem to be many challenges because of insurance and um, our whole system of health care. Um, how does that particularly affect the African American community and recruitment of medical personnel? Well, um, that's a very good question because really we are going through a revolution in our health system. It's changing and, and that's in a one sense it's good. Um, uh, because, for example, we have new kinds of professionals. When I went to medical school, there were no such thing as physician assistant nurse practitioners. When they came along, the AMA and my colleagues in medicine fought them. Uh, but that battle, is, that was back in the 60s, 70s, that battle is pretty much over now. I happen to be on the board of Grady Hospital, a big hospital, in, a public hospital in Atlanta. Physicians, assistants, nurse practitioners are on the staff. They're welcome. Uh, and they are part of physician practice groups, uh, et, et, et cetera. So that's one uh, uh, thing. We're, going, we're having pharmacists serve more to educate people about drugs. Uh, we, we have uh, all kinds of technology that expands the capability of, of physicians. 
uh, not only in their offices, but they can be in touch with their patients miles away. And we even have robotic surgery, et cetera. So, so the medicine that I entered uh, you know, back in 58 when I graduated from medical school is very different uh, uh, today. Now, the Affordable Care Act uh, has now been the realization of what a lot of presidents, starting with Teddy Roosevelt, wanted to have. It's still not fully implemented, and there's still rumbles about trying to repeal it, which I think is a serious mistake and waste of time, causes confusion and, and so forth. It's not perfect, and, and, and I could list a lot of things uh, that really should be better for it, but I believe what we need to do is work to, to, to improve it. But that brings more people into the system. It's going to bring 30, we have 50 million people without insurance. It doesn't solve the problem. It's going to bring about 32 million more people in, into the system. Uh, and we still have to go even beyond that. But getting those 32 million is still, uh, is still, still an issue. Along with this has been all of the issues of eligibility and qualifications and, and, and all of that. So, so the bureaucracy really has developed uh, and it's stifling, and we really need to do something about that. We also have a malpractice problem. Uh, we, uh, I'm very, uh, I hate malpractice lawyers. Uh, I, I think, <laughs> really, it, it's sort of a lottery. I think we should have a no-fault malpractice system. Malpractice does occur, but I think we should have panels to judge uh, people who've been hurt uh, by uh, errors in diagnosis or uh, inappropriate therapy by physicians, and have um, uh, certainly punitive things, but, but really have it operating more like insurance. And people are harmed. We don't need to have this complicated lottery where either you, know, you win big or you lose, you don't get, get, get anything. So, so the fact is we have all these things that are going on uh, in, in the system. Now, meanwhile, we're changing as a country. As all of you know, the Census Bureau has said by the year 2042 or 43, there will no longer be a white majority population. Uh, so we need uh, to try and have the health professions become more like the rest of our, our population. So all of those things mean that there are a lot of moving parts here. So, so I think that um, this is unsettling. Change is always uh, unsettling. But if we do it right, I think we'll come out the other end 10, 20, 25 years from now. With a, with a better system, uh, but uh, we really have to somehow, uh, as much as we can, take the politics out of, out of health care. That's really is, is poisoned it, um, uh, here because it, it's amazing to me that the idea of seeing that people have health insurance gets so much political uh, re resistance uh, a year. With my value system, the most important things we can invest in is first education, see that we have an educated population, and health care, to see that we have a healthy population. If you're not healthy, you may not be able to work. If you are healthy, then you can work and support your family, uh, et, et, et cetera. So, um, so I, those are the things that I think we're really all confused about as a, as a society. But um, uh, overall, we have made tremendous progress in, in medicine in the diseases that we have been able to develop good therapies for, in our understanding of human biology and the promise that we have for even better therapies coming in, in, in the future. I think those are great investments. But meanwhile, everything has been thrown up and, and there are all the conflicts. But I, uh, I, I say to young people, while the administrative aspects of medicine can be confusing and challenging, the biology of medicine has never been more attractive. The fact that we understand so much more and we have the promise of being able to do so, so much more. The science is very exciting and the promise uh, really is, is tremendous. Hello, uh, Caleb Wilson from the School of Medicine here at Penn and proud graduate of Auckland State University. I'm also an affiliate uh, member of the center. Uh, so we have a situation where there's, you mentioned earlier, the value of minority serving institutions. But one of the things that I rarely hear is the economic impact. So what would be your argument of uh, the increased economic impact of having minority serving institutions in the country? Oh, there's a very uh, 
strong, very positive economic impact of uh, minority serving institutions. The best example I can give you that there are uh, the Atlanta University Center Schools in Atlanta. Now, um, many of you who are familiar with Atlanta know that there's a strong black middle class in Atlanta. That's primarily because the Atlanta University Center is there. That, the, that, all those schools in that consortium have turned out young people who have stayed in Atlanta in business or in law or medicine uh, or as entrepreneurs, etc. Et and fortunately in Atlanta too we have had a very enlightened white community, a white business community. Bob Woodruff, who uh, years ago was the CEO of Coca-Cola, really one of the guiding spirits in the business community uh, in Atlanta. Uh, became very successful, very wealthy. He used this wealth productively, set up the Woodruff Foundation uh, there. So, so um, this is a good example of, of the impact. When you go around the country, you'll see other examples of, of that as, as well. And with health professionals, too, where we need more health professionals, they tend to be economic centers there. An office may have four or five people at hires, but they buy supplies, um, uh, and they, they are serviced by um, uh, plumbers, by janitorial companies, they rent space, et, 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 et cetera. So by having more professionals in the community, you're serving really um, not only to provide services, but also to be, have an economic impact. So, so that, that's very important. Is there one back here? Yeah. Oh. Yes. Hi. Hi. I'm Kelsey Jones. Um, I'm currently a doctoral student here at uh, the Graduate School of Education. Thank you so much for taking time to come talk to us. Really appreciate it. Um, you talked about, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about the psychological effects of um, being a, a black member of society and your own obstacles. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about. Um, stigma around mental health in black communities and thinking through um, talking about that stigma and bringing more black health care providers into the mental health profession um, in medical schools generally? Well, again, that's, that's a very important question because um, uh, I'd say within medicine, this is one of the areas uh, where the services that we are providing are far from what's needed. Uh, and, and the impact we could have in terms of improving the lives of people can be so much greater than it is now. But, but the reality is we still have stigma in our society, and we don't really allocate sufficient resources to take care of mental illness as, you know, as, as, as well. Um, we're better uh, than, than uh, was the case 10 years ago. Uh, but I'd say um, when I was growing up, people talked about cancer in the same way that they talk about mental illness. Someone got cancer, you spoke in a hushed tones. It was really uh, sort of almost a stigma, mysterious, et cetera. But, but now, I think, we, because of the educational activities of organizations like the American Cancer Society and others um, in the health professions, as well as the progress that we have made in treating cancer, so it's no longer uh, the, the mysterious thing are no longer an automatic death sentence that people are cured uh, of a number of cancers and so forth. So I, I predict that we're going to have a similar kind of thing with mental uh, illness, but, but we really have not, as a society, owned up to doing the things that we know that will, will, be, will be better. And we shun this a, a, a too much. But I, I think the more we talk about it and really kind of take away the mystery and the shame and, and, and the stigma, the more we'll be willing to invest the time and effort and resources to, to address that. Because the reality is that uh, so many families are affected by it, so it's not uh, you know, any mystery. But, but we really have a lot to do there to, to really address that. Thank you. Other questions? Hello, Dr. Sullivan. Uh, I'm Carol Foster. I'm a school psychologist with the School District of Philadelphia. I'm a graduate of the Graduate School of Education as well as Spelman College in Atlanta. Um, my question is this addresses very much what the young lady just mentioned concerning mental health, but something else. 
and, and I, the school district assigned me to North Philadelphia um, in the last two years. And what I come in contact with every day, even today, are children who live in a culture of violence, who live with stress every day, that it's become normal. They don't even know it's normal. It's, it's you know, the, the abnormal has become normal for them. And, and I know that you understand, as a doctor, the impact, of, the effects of stress on um, health, uh, hypertension. We, we know all the different things that have been cited in research that, that, that stress has. But stress also has an impact on cognitive development and intellectual functioning in children, academic achievement. No one really talks that makes the connection between that. The school district desperately, like most school districts across the country, want children, our children to have high test scores. Teachers are under the gun if they don't make a certain reach level of, of scores and you know, people are penalized and so. But what I want the school district to understand is that the children won't achieve, um, won't make ac academic achievement or get the high test scores if the problems with the families, the mental health, the mental illness, the chronic stress, the violence in the community that causes the stress, the poverty that causes, well, is, if it's not addressed, then they're not gonna get those high test scores or those high grades. We're not gonna be able to compete you have a question? globally. And I, my question is, how do we, thank you, mm -hmm. how do we address dealing with reducing the stress in the black community that has an impact on academic achievement? Well. It's a good question, and it's a complex uh, question because there's no one answer. Um, it it uh, includes doing what we can to help strengthen the home environment. You know, uh, I'm sure that uh, many of these children really may come from uh, environments that they don't feel safe or secure or loved uh, at, at home. So uh, that's where organizations like the local Y or 100 Black Men or some social organization that could really um, help uh, you know, these children, give them a place where they feel safe you know, and, and secure, where they can express their aspirations or their frustrations or, or, you know, or, or their fears. Uh, again, uh, things to, to create an environment where achievement is recognized. See, what was important to me and what was important to every youngster coming along is being affirmed. You know, I, I mentioned the fact that my mother, when I said I wanted to be a doctor, she didn't say, oh, gee, that's, you can't be a doctor, or that costs too much, or you're not smart enough. No, she said, absolutely, that's great. So there was no question in my mind. Uh, and, but, so we need to have environments that really work with uh, young people. And, and, so it, and it really depends upon what's available, you know, I, I think an organization that's doing a tremendous job around the country is 100 black men uh, who are working with, with uh, youngsters. There are other uh, programs, um, there are program, I've, I've forgotten the men in New York who provide scholarships to uh, black students who finish high school, et, et cetera. All these kinds of things, and we need them. And again, we need to have, again, people like Bill Cosby who would say, we have these problems, we need to address it, we can't sweep this up under, under the rug uh, uh, here. So in, so in other words, uh, we have to admit there are issues, we have to face up to them, because if we don't, you're not going to address them, you're going to try and sweep, sweep them un, un, under the rug. Uh, yeah. They're not unique to the black community, these are problems of poverty. Uh, there's problems in the Native American community, uh, in the Hispanic community, in the white community. Uh, so there's nothing uh, to be ashamed of from a racial perspective, but uh, we need to uh, do everything we can to say, let's find a way to really work with these young people and give them uh, an alternative to really a violent community and, and not have a, a community where they feel that their value uh, in the community is how bad they are. <coughs> Let's say back in the community is how smart are you? You know, and, and we, we we have places where um, you know young people um, are not affirmed you know, for, for for that. We need to we need to do that. So there are a lot of things we can do. So again, there's no one answer. It's really a series of things. 
So we have time for probably one more question. Does anybody, anybody like to ask a question? Okay. All right, over here, Joy. Hello, my name is Joy Baker. I'm also a proud graduate of Spelman College, and I'm a master's student here at the Graduate School of Education. I'm taking Mary Beth's class. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask a question around what do you believe is the next big world health issue, and how, as we as Americans, especially young Americans, help address that issue and help eradicate it? Well, I gave a prediction, but um, I won't be around to see <laughs> uh, uh, how true it is. It's always dangerous making predictions. From my perspective, well, bit, first of all, it depends on how, how you look. You can look at it from the standpoint of what might be a great scientific breakthrough. I think that we're on the verge of that with the Human Genome Project really having given us information about the human uh, genetic makeup. We'd, we're close to now producing pharmaceuticals uh, and other devices that really will give what we call personalized medicine. See, when we give an <laughs> antibiotic, no, we're really giving something that treats most things. But when we're able to really give something that's specifically tailored for your genetic makeup, we have a better outcome and a lower incidence of complications, uh, et cetera. That's one way of looking at it. But another way, uh, is, is this. Um, you mentioned medical education in South Africa and blacks. This is an organization that uh, came into being in 1985 to really support black health profession students in South Africa. The universities were opening up. Uh, so our purpose was not only to help increase the number of black physicians in South Africa, because there were less than 500 in the whole country, some 40 million blacks. Um, uh, but um, uh, not only to increase them, but also to facilitate the dismantling of apartheid, because universities were offering admissions to black students, but frequently there was no scholarship support. So this organization that I was part of um, until 2008, when we uh, put the organization down because things had changed so much, we supported 10,000 students who became either doctors, nurses, pharmacists, uh, community health, health workers there. But we were also helping to dismantle apartheid by giving students a means to, to accept an offer to attend the University of Witzwaldstrand or Stellenbosch or University of Cape Town or what have you. Right now, uh, one of the areas where we have a tremendous need is on the African continent. Africa has 25% of the world's burden of disease, but only 3% of the world's health professionals. Africa is a continent that is resource rich, but people poor. You have diamonds, gold, aluminum, tin, you know, bauxite, uh, oil, etc. Et uh, but because of its tragic history, you have weak governments, corrupt governments, etc. Et uh, if we could really um, uh, help those countries develop. First of all, they become training partners for us. And we'll be better off by having a strong Senegal, or Angola, or Liberia, or Kenya, uh, to, to trade uh, uh, with us. They will be better off uh, as, as well. Their health will improve uh, too. So, so from, from a global perspective, addressing health issues uh, on the African continent really would make a tremendous uh, different, uh, difference. But it also should come with other things to strengthen those, those governments because uh, for me it's not good enough to have a few billionaires uh, and a very uh, poor population but really have a strong middle class uh, there. So that, that's a great, great challenge uh, I think for those who are looking for an opportunity for an interesting career. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so before I thank you uh, officially, uh, I wanted you guys all to know that uh, we have a lot of things going on after this uh, conversation. Uh, Dr. Sullivan is going to be signing books, if you're interested, um, his autobiography and also the book that we wrote together, The Morehouse Mystique. Uh, so he'll be signing those over there for a little while. And we have lots of food and drink. And we also have uh, Kevin Valentine's trio, uh, jazz trio, that's going to perform for us. So please, please stick around. We would love that. 
And I'm sure that you're more than happy to talk to people as well, right? Um, because we're holding you captive. Um, and, uh, and anyway, I just want to thank you so much. It was such a delight. And you know, I know I spent two whole years with you writing a book, but, um, but it's always wonderful to hear uh, about your life. And it's really, really inspiring. And I can only hope that I can have uh, even this much influence as you have on people's lives. So thank you so much. <laughs>